Asif, I think we're live now. Okay, thank you very much, Francia, and uh, welcome everybody to our uh, webinar. Uh, this is the second uh, webinar of 2017, and I, I really hope that you enjoy the next hour. Um, the focus of the session is decanylation of the tracheostomy in the adult population. And we're going to cover both inpatient and outpatient perspectives of that. Uh, we're uh, really fortunate to have some wonderful uh, panel, expert panel guests today. And I'd like to, first of all, introduce uh, Vincia Pandian, who is an assistant professor um, in the Department of Acute and Chronic Care, John Hopkins University School of Nursing. And she's done some really wonderful stuff uh, and published some really wonderful stuff. Uh, looking into this area. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, my, my colleague from John Hopkins, um, Professor Alexander Hillel, um, who's an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, based in John Hopkins, and uh, works with Vincia. Um, two other names to mention. Um, there's my good friend and colleague James Lynch, who's been doing some wonderful work with Brendan McGrath, um, uh, spreading the gospel of the GTC, um, and uh, he's been uh, he's, he's got a nursing background, and um, and specifically an intensivist background. So thank you, James. And, and finally, uh, Professor Al Marati, who's another otolaryngologist from the University of Washington Medical Center, who will hopefully join us later. Uh, and, uh, and I form um, the uh, fifth member of the panel. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you on now to Vincia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asad Arora in GTC for giving us this opportunity to discuss about various practices associated with decanylation of a tracheostomy tube. The main objectives of our webinar today is listed here and should be in a PDF attached to um, this webinar. You should be able to download it and view it. The one unwritten agenda that we have here is to discuss some of the active issues that exist in our practice um, and try to figure out what we can do or what we can research or accomplish in the near future as a global tracheostomy collaborative. When the underlying indication for why a tracheostomy was performed has been resolved, we start the conversation of possibly decanylating the tracheostomy tube. We're specifically going to be discussing a planned decanylation this evening and not focus on accidental decanylation. So why is this decanylation a big concern among clinicians? The reason is because there is so much variation in practice between countries and institutions and even within institutions. Uh, within an institution, there are multiple specialties such as otolaryngologists, trauma surgeons, pulmonologists, and anesthesiologists who perform a tracheostomy and eventually manage decanylation. Nurses and respiratory therapists caring for these patients have different levels of comfort and are expected to follow the practice based on which specialty provider is managing that patient. Um, there is also a lack of consensus regarding the need for capping trial and when to decanylate. The bottom line is that if certain factors are not taken into consideration while planning for decanylation, the patient might be at a risk for a loss of airway, uh, might need reintubation or cricothyroidotomy, uh, patient safety is what is compromised and what drives us to improve our practice. I did a quick review of literature to see what factors suggest that a patient is ready for decanylation and found that the patient's ability to cough up and clear secretions, ability to tolerate capping, effective swallowing, and being awake and possibly interactive were all indicators that suggest that patients might be ready for decanylation. In addition, in patients with cervical spine injury, the ability to shrug their shoulders was an important requirement 
um, also to successfully pass the decoration process. Some other articles discuss the need for establishing patency of the airway for the bronchoscopy for adult patients who've had the tracheostomy for a long period of time. So what are the contraindications or red flags? Patients with upper airway obstruction, such as subglottic or tracheal stenosis, or those who are hemodynamically unstable are not considered to be ready for decamination. Um, if patients have had any difficult airway or have had a history of difficulty with intubation, it should raise a red flag. And caution must be used before removing that tracheostomy tube. While the practice of decanalation varies among all inpatient settings in the United States, I would like to take a moment to describe our decanalation practice at the Johns Hopkins Hospital that has been disseminated to several other hospitals within the country. At our institution, we use a standardized protocol or approach to capping and decanalating a patient so that there are no surprises or uncertainties. When the primary team taking care of a patient with a tracheostomy identifies that the underlying reason for a tracheostomy has been resolved, they contact our team. Um, as a multidisciplinary team, each person within the team has a role in evaluating the patient and completing a capping checklist in the electronic medical record. The authorized prescriber, meaning a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, would fill out the first set of capping um, screening questions, following, uh, followed by a speech-language pathologist or a bedside nurse or respiratory therapist. Finally, the authorized prescriber reviews all the team members' input to decide if the patient is truly eligible for capping trial. The eligibility criteria include the following. The patient should have the smallest size tracheostomy that's available, which is usually size 4.0 cuffless tube at our institution. Uh, we ensure that the patient is able to breathe comfortably with finger occlusion for one minute, tolerate speaking valve during waking hours, able to cough up secretions, maintain stable oxygen, oxygen saturation, and is alert and able to demonstrate adequate dexterity, which means the patient is able to remove the tracheostomy cap in case of a respiratory distress. If the patient is not able to do it, then we would arrange for a sitter to be at the bedside to identify any emergent situation and call for assistance. The patient should not require frequent suctioning. This is another requirement. Other important clinical considerations that, um, that are there is that there should be no need for, no anticipated need for sedation or anesthesia or a procedure that is planned in the near future. If the patient passes all the capping screening questions, then a speech language pathologist is the only person who's allowed to cap the patient in our institution because he or she will be able to be with the patient and monitor the patient for 30 minutes to an hour and then sign out to the nurse before leaving the room. So if a patient passed all the questions, they would be capped for 24 hours. If the patient did not pass all the capping screening questions, then we would attempt to address those issues. Uh, for example, if the patient had a difficult airway, then we would scope the patient to establish patency prior to starting capping trial. If the patient failed, and, but we were able to address the issue, then the patient would undergo a conservative approach of being capped for 12 hours at first, then they take a break, and then we restart capping trial the next day for 24 hours. If the patient fails the screening tool and we're unable to establish patency or decrease the frequency of suctioning and so on, then we would hold off the capping trial until the patient is really appropriate for the capping trial. We also have a tracheostomy order set that's actually available on electronic medical record that the provider can quickly customize to the patient's needs. Uh, this helps everyone in the team to be on the same page regarding the plan for that particular patient. 
We also place a sign on the door so that the team members know that a tracheostomy cap or plug is in place. Once a patient completes the capping trial, then the respiratory therapist is the one who's designated to decannulate the tracheostomy tube, provide the stomach care, and document in the patient's medical record. If the patient has had a challenging airway, we may decannulate them in a, an intensive care unit setting, but we've never really had a uh, need to take a patient to the operating room. I think we take patients to the operating room if we have to extubate a patient with difficult airway, but most of the times we've been successful decannulating a difficult or challenging tracheostomy tube in an ICU setting. If the patient fails a capping trial, then they can restart the capping trial the following day or wait until the patient has been deemed to be ready for the capping trial. We would say that a patient failed a capping trial if they are unable to maintain their oxygen saturations within the ordered parameters by the provider. Um, even after attempting to place maybe two liters of oxygen through the nasal cannula. If the oxygen requirement um, increase is significant, especially if it's greater than 40%, or if the cap or plug needs to be removed for any clinical reason, then we would consider that they have failed the capping trial. Usually the nurse would uh, communicate with the respiratory therapist or the speech pathologist or the physician or the nurse practitioner who fully failed the capping trial. Um, the pictures that you see here are the steps that we use to decannulate the tracheostomy tube at our institution and provide stoma care. Uh, once we remove the tracheostomy tube, we clean the stoma with saline, apply tincture benzoin around the stoma, not into the stoma, to prep the skin, and then apply cherry strips with counter traction so that the stoma is closed. Uh, we then take a gauze ball to place on the stereo strip and then dress it with a wide rectangular adhesive tape so that it doesn't peel off every time the patient turns his or her head. Uh, finally, we educate the patients and family members to place a finger on the dressing while talking or coughing to avoid the air from leaking through the stoma. Uh, we also educate them to change the dressing as needed uh, for the first seven days after which they can remove the dressing along with the sterile strips. If the stoma doesn't close within three weeks, they are educated to contact us for further management. This may include um, slight scraping of the stomal edges to allow granulation, or uh, sometimes they may be taken back to the operating room for a three-step surgical closure. Um, at this time, I'm going to request one of our co-presenters, Dr. Albert Murati, to share any key points from the clinical consensus statement on tracheostomy care that's um, been published by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Foundation. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks for including me. I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. I see yeah. some nodding heads, and thank you to all the nice people all over. Uh, a couple of things. Thank you. I had the privilege of being part of the uh, American Academy's consensus statement on tracheotomy care. And it was run by Ron Mitchell and a very professional job. Now remember, this is a consensus statement. What does that tell us? That tells us that we didn't have enough actual evidence to have uh, guidelines or other more formal document and analysis, systemic analysis, all these things. I'm not very savvy about all these terms. All I can tell you is there wasn't enough evidence to make uh, stronger statements. That's why it's a consensus statement. It was done with the Delphi method or Delphi method, I'm not sure how you say that, which is uh, you know a bunch of people sit in a virtual room and come up with a bunch of statements about this topic. And then one by one, we try to state the things that we truly all agree on for the things that many of us believe but we don't all universally agree on, which ends up resulting in a number of uh, highly su well-supported statements, OK? So it's a clinical consensus statement uh, on tracheotomy, tracheostomy care. Now, remember, only a part of this had to do with decannulation. Now, that having been said, I think 10 or so of the 70 or 80 consensus statements had specifically to do with decannulation. And I want to reflect on what my colleague just said, 
by saying uh, just a couple things about the simulations. First of all, the best single indicator that you're you're having good tracheotomy care results is that you have a protocol. The presence or absence of a protocol just means that somebody's paying attention, whether or not it's in reaction to an unfortunate event, or um, you know, as an anticipation or improving care. Uh, I don't know how each of us got there, where we we have a programmed uh, plan. The, I could say that most of these uh, protocols could have wide variabilities, but the presence of an interest group of people and a protocol is probably a good sign that you're doing pretty well. Within that, the specifics, frankly, I was just looking, reading the 10 or so consensus statements, statements that achieved universal, near, near or total consensus, near universal or total consensus on decanation alone, frankly, were almost all the things that uh, Dr. P just said. You know that the patient has to have no upcoming procedures. They may have they have had they had the, shown the ability to cough, that uh, have the capacity to take care of their own cap, that uh, that they've had a bronchoscopy uh, or some some sort of ex endoscopic excuse me endoscopic airway examination, one after another. And frankly, just in the conversational presentation, very nicely done, uh, that covered almost all of them. I could list them off for you, but it's certainly available. A couple of things to remember about the consensus statement. This was a mix of both pediatric and adult practitioners, which is wonderful, but also had some, you know, made, made the manuscript a little confusing. Be be aware that some of the um, some of the guidelines, excuse me, the consensus statements were specifically for peds and some of them for adults, and they're listed on there. So I would say having a team is important. Dr. Aurora from the UK and his colleagues have shown us how important it is just having a plan. Having a plan for taking the trach and getting rid of the trach is probably the single best indicator that you're doing, you know, a, a, great, a better job with, with tracheotomy care. It's hard to imagine a point in medicine where medical economics, patient safety, and clinical care intersect better than improving tracheotomy care. So I'm appreciating being part of this, and uh, there's a little bit of religion to all this, a little bit of science. But uh, I think it's great that we're organized and uh, we're all moving the ball forward, all the folks involved here. So thank you. Um, so that summarizes the practices in the inpatient setting from, a, from the United States perspective. Um, I'll now invite Mr. James Lynch, who is a charge nurse for the National Quality Improvement Project for the Tracheosmic Care in the UK, uh, who's also an ICU nurse at the University Hospital at South Manchester to describe the decanylation practices in inpatient settings in the UK. He, this is frozen. Haley, is it worth asking James to log back in? In the meantime, Pincia can progress with the next phase of the scheduled lecture. Okay. I don't think James can actually hear us. It looks like he's logging back in right now. Did he get voted off the island? What happened? <laughs> Let's give him a minute. Uh, he's okay. pretty good about getting back on track. Well, let, let me bring up the most, just as a little filler for 30 seconds, the single most contentious point of the guideline, the excuse me, consensus statement was the use of the term tracheostomy versus tracheotomy. <laughs> so, and there's, they even took pity on the dinosaur, that's me, and they put a line in there talking about that you know, old people like me call it tracheotomy when it's really a tracheotomy. That there's a difference, but I'll just confess, I've given up. So, <laughs> on, but it's a tracheotomy, and everyone else is wrong. I feel like the act of performing uh, an opening in the trachea is tracheotomy, but the end result is a tracheostomy. Because you, you call have... it after three days. Yeah. Well, so there's some very operative care issues, but uh, anyway. But it was a fun fight, and I lost, just so you know. <laughs> uh, 
Hello. Ah, fantastic. Well done. Well done. Sorry about that. I, uh, my internet connection seems to have uh, disappeared at a vital moment. No problem, James. Thanks for uh, getting back to us. And I think Vincia was uh, um, looking for you to um, give the audience some insight okay. into the decannulation process from the inpatient perspective. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so, uh, a lot of what we know about tracheostomy related behaviours in the UK come from the uh, 20. 14 Entebot report, um, which uh, is referenced later. Um, so this looked, it was a, a nationwide audit uh, involving over 2,500 tracheostomy cases. Um, and out of those, about 48% of all trachees on the critical care were decannulated before either discharge from critical care or death. And on the wards, uh, percent of all patients were, were decannulated before going home. Um, so the next slide, we can see that uh, the majority of the time it's actually nursing staff who perform decannulation in the UK um, and that's going to be important when you're looking at uh, competencies, guidelines and protocols. They need to be designed for the nursing staff, not necessarily the medical staff. Unfortunately, the majority of the guidance in the UK comes from non-nursing bodies. Uh, so Entipod also made some recommendations about tracheostomy care in the UK. And they, one of those was that uh, there should be some multidisciplinary agreement about minimum airway assessments before taking a tracheostomy out. And they made this recommendation to the relevant professional bodies. Um, since then, and I've had a good look round, the only ones that I can see that have been updated come from the Intensive Care Society. Um, elsewhere, so uh, Entipod found that uh, endoscopic assessment should be made um, when, when deemed necessary. That only seems to happen in less than 2% of cases. Um, that's probably not needed for everyone but it's the best assessment we can make of somebody's upper airway. And it can often be done in conjunction with a speech and language therapist. Um, unfortunately, what we know from the UK is that not all speech and language therapists and not all hospitals have access to speech and language therapists with fibre optic endoscopic skills. But that's not going to happen at every hospital. Uh, one of the other things they said was that about 20% of the decannulations that the ENTSPOD team reviewed uh, didn't involve sufficiently careful airway assessment. So we need to make airway assessments before decannulating. On the intensive care where I work, uh, we have all sorts of luxuries. So we have uh, capnography. We often trial top down weaning, as described by Vincent uh, earlier. And potentially capping, quite often the use of speaking valves, which will give you a good assessment of whether you've got a, a reasonable upper airway before removing a trachea. On the wards, things are a little bit more limit, limited, and quite often it might just be the ability to vocalise on cough deflation, or the ability to, to vocalise with finger occlusion. It gives you a good assessment of the upper airway. Um, so since then support, like I said, the ICS have reviewed their guidance. Um, so they suggest that the, the choice to decannulate should be a multidisciplinary decision in keeping with everything we try to say at the, the GTC. Uh, like Vincia said, they agree with the uh, US guidelines that a tracking should be removed as soon as it's no longer required, as soon as the original reason for the tracheostomy has uh, been treated effectively. Um, and they also provide a checklist for use prior to weaning, uh, which may be helpful and is available on the Intensive Care Society's website and via uh, NICE, who publish quite a lot of guidance in terms of safety in the UK. 
Uh, so the RCS also reviewed various decannulation and weaning protocols that are used around the UK and available on the internet. I think uh, St George's have a very good one. Uh, to most of these, they suggest that they work well in their local settings, and it's worth considering that uh, with a move in the UK towards regional specialist centres at uh, single service hospitals, most hospitals have very different tracheostomy populations. Hospital might not be the best weaning protocol for a cardiac surgery centre or a, a, an ENT head and neck hospital. Uh, most of the protocols out there involve some sort of cup deflation, different types of tube, reducing uh, tube size and allowing more air through the upper airway to assess that, the use of capping or more of Sounds like we've lost him again. Um, maybe we'll keep moving forward in the interest of time. Um, so um, maybe we'll give him an opportunity to chime in when we have our discussion. Um, at this time, we'll change our gears to learning about the decannulation practices in the outpatient setting. So we'll start with Dr. Alexander Hillel, who will provide us a U.S. perspective first. Thanks, Vincia. Thanks for uh, including me as part of the panel in this presentation. Um, I th the, the real difference with outpatient versus inpatient decannulation is um, the ability to observe, or really lack of ability to observe the patient as well as we can in an inpatient setting, where you can um, either have someone in the room for the first 30 minutes as uh, Dr. Pandian mentioned in our inpatient capping um, protocol, uh, or even monitor the patient with capnography, which can help. So there's a few other factors that are involved in addition to the safety component. One is trust. And I do find um, that most patients are usually pretty honest about um, breathing. But some are so eager to get their trach out that um, they, they may fool you. So I think that the, the considerations to keep in mind for outpatient decannulation is, one, is the patient ready to trial capping? Um, uh, do they need their airway um, assessed, uh, either the larynx or um, even the proximal trachea between the larynx and the tracheostomy tube, which can be a most difficult location to assess on an outpatient basis? And then another couple of issues that um, are really important to keep in mind. Do the patient have obstructive sleep apnea? And it may not be the reason that they had their trach, but the co-prevalence of sleep apnea means that the trach was probably treating their sleep apnea. And do they have a CPAP machine um, at home? There have been a few patients that I've sent for a sleep evaluation and to get fitted for a CPAP machine prior to, to moving ahead with decannulation. And then, um, as discussed, how, how do they handle their secretions? And do they have dysphagia? Um, looking at the clinical consensus statement that Dr. Marathi reviewed, these are a few of the statements that are relevant to outpatient um, capping and potential decannulation. Um, can they uh, protect their airway from aspiration? Do they have an effective cough? And then again, the uh, airway evaluation, if necessary. So there are um, a few of the um, things that I have. Uh, we can keep moving ahead a few slides. The aspects that I, I really consider um, are one: while I'm while the patient's in the room in an outpatient setting, I will I'll do a five or ten minute capping trial um, by placing the trach and just observing them. Do they look comfortable? Uh, during that time, um, I'll, or, or even, you know, again, usually we have long-term relationships with these patients. Do they have the physical and, more important, the mental ability to take care of their trach? Can they manage to, de to uh, uncap the trach if they feel short of breath? And so one of the questions to ask is, should a capping trial be performed as an inpatient? Um, and 
the other um, components to consider is um, should family member, is there a family member that, uh, and that's probably a little on the conservative side, but I have um, really liked to have a family member who can observe the patient at night or at least remain with the patient in their bedroom the first night that they're capped. So moving ahead to uh, my unofficial protocol, I'll have the patients cap the tracheostomy tube during the day and then leave it uncapped that evening. Um, and then the next day, day two, proceed to cap for 24 hours or more. I usually ask the patient to um, cap for 48 hours continuously prior to the cannulation in the office. And simply for uh, scheduling purposes in clinic, it's more oftentimes a week or longer that they can remain capped. So usually, again, a pretty good assessment of how well they're tolerating it. But to summarize, for the out, on the outpatient side, it, it really is much more about trust between you and um, the patient who has the tracheostomy. I'm going to request uh, Dr. Aurora to describe the decannulation practice in the outpatient settings uh, from the UK perspective. Thanks, Vincia, and, and thanks to Alexander. It's, it's uh, an interesting um, area because it really highlights the disparity in practice, and, and, and perhaps we can this will come out a little bit more in the discussion. I hope it does, um, and perhaps it reflects our healthcare systems to to some degree, and the support thereof within the um, community setting. Um, in in short, um, the considerations that that the Dr. Hillel um, outlined are um, are no different. Um, and those considerations would be thought through in an outpatient setting and, and throughout the UK there are several examples of outpatient tracheostomy specific and usually nurse-led um, clinics where um, patients are followed up, tracheostomy tubes are certainly changed um, and maintenance and appropriate maintenance and care of that tube uh, evaluated. Um, however, it would be fair to say that in the UK, the general practice, to my knowledge, and I've done a little bit of a straw poll before coming out with this, um, is that if one were to feel that decannulation was appropriate, and in the best interest of the patient, then that patient would actually be admitted into the hospital for a trial of decannulation. Um, and um, thus far, decannulating patients in the outpatient setting is not something that is routinely practiced in the UK. Uh, now, I am waiting for a flood of <laughs> messages or emails to, uh, uh, to correct me thus far, but, but, but I, as I said, I've spoken to um, a few people about this just to make sure that it wasn't just me thinking that this is the case. Um, there's a, a team in Cambridge, obviously my colleagues up in Manchester, uh, and, and team guys, and, and there's certainly a, a unanimous opinion in, 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 in some of the main centres that I'm aware of. It's not essentially common practice for decannulation to be done in the outpatient setting. That's not to say that we don't change tubes. Um, and perhaps now this is an opportune time, hopefully if James is back with us, to, uh, for him to pick up on the, um, on the decannulation as inpatient, because that, essentially we've almost gone full loop and back to James. James, are you with us? Yeah, we'll see if this works for very long. Sorry. That, I, I think I only have one more point to, to make. Before, if you, before, can all before you do, do, do you agree with what I said there in, in, in your experience up in uh, North Manchester and yeah, um, so from what we, Sorry. From what, from what we've seen to, in the, the ITC projects, we have over 20 sites and I'm not too sure that any of them have 
a, a clinic where patients would be decannulated as an outpatient. Uh, from time to time, there are there are clinics where a patient may be brought in for an inpatient stay, which normally ends up being about five to seven days to, to look for decannulation yeah. assessment, weaning, and then decannulated. Yeah. Thank you. Super. You so the, the other point uh, about uh, the UK setting, inpatient setting, will be um, the uh, rate of failed decannulation. Uh, so before that, you, you need to define decannulation. There's various definitions ranging from 48 hours to 96 hours. Um, the GTC uh, suggests the definition of 72 hours. Um, and the point I was going to make with that is just in terms of ICU, um, how many how many patients do we discharge from RCU well within 72 hours of uh, decannulating them? And I'd imagine it's the majority across most sites in the UK. Um, and with that in mind, the, the ICS guidelines, they also recommend that the team involved in insertion and removal maintain some patient contact uh, with the patient post decannulation for a good 72, 96 hours, um, whether they're discharged out to a ward, to a different adult hospital, or even out into the community. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lynch. Um, I want to thank all of you for sharing your perspective from both outpatient and inpatient perspective, um, and also from both UK and US perspective. Um, I think that it was quite enlightening to hear of such variation in practice, especially in the outpatient setting. Um, I think this, is, this will probably lead to good discussion um, very shortly. But to summarize, the main reason why we're concerned about proper decannulation practices is because we want to ensure uh, patient safety and reduce the number of adverse events such as loss of airways, reintubations, cricoperiodotomies, and poor stoma healing. We don't want patients walking around in the community with a small hole in their neck not knowing how to facilitate wound healing. And if complications do occur, um, they should be aware that it could potentially be surgically fixed. Um, a standardized approach will help in removing uncertainties and decrease anxiety levels among providers. Um, it can also help with communication and decrease the number of decannulation failures. Uh, Tobin and his colleagues described the importance of a team approach. Our um, consensus statement talks about a team approach. And I've learned from my own uh, research and from my own practice that multidisciplinary team approach is the ideal way to successful decannulation. So this time I would like to open up the floor or this platform for discussion um, and all of us here as presenters or experts in the area will be happy to entertain any questions. Um, I did write two questions up there that we had received from um, folks who had emailed us earlier. Um, I think one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves at this moment is, what are the active issues that we're dealing with in our clinical practice and what can we do to help address those issues? Um, and also we talked about standardized protocol being available in inpatient setting uh, both in UK and US. Um, is that something that can be taken out to outpatient setting? If we have a protocol out there, would it be feasible in terms of decreasing the dollar expenses for these patients or for the to decrease the healthcare cost. Um, something that I would like to open up to each one of you to start um, asking some questions or having a more dialogue about it. Well one thing I'd like to chime in on um, is really just to reframe this or emphasize this if this was brought up earlier. You know we have to remember there's two different populations generally we're speaking about. We're speaking about the ill unexpected tracheotomy, I don't mean emergent, but sort of the medical ICU type tracheotomy. Then there's the whole group that are related to surgery or prophylactically. You know, 
there are the considerations are not entirely different, but the clinical scenario is different. And you know, those are patients we often decanulate as outpatients. Another thing is the 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 taking the outpatient and admitting them specifically for decannulation. We do that here too. It really depends on you know their eyes, their hands, can they take care of themselves, their comorbidities. So I think it's all very important. I think some of the ongoing issues that we're going to be faced with is some of the the, the trickier parts of decannulation. Zandi was onto one I think with the the the, the co prevalence of sleep apnea. Uh, I think there are it's very difficult to predict trach site stenosis in patients. Patients who look good on de, while capped somehow they're able to the presence of the trach is holding enough of the trachea open. Uh, even, even breathing around it, uh, but when you take the trach out, that, that leads to some secondary collapse. These are some real challenges for patients. Uh, patients who live far away, patients who live, you know, are, don't have access to healthcare. I mean, I think these are all things that face each of us on this uh, webinar. Yeah. The other thing I would add to that, and it, it feeds off of Dr. Marathi's point, is specifically glottic stenosis, which is an iatrogenic. Um, issue usually from prolonged intubation or an endotracheal tube that is too, um, too big for the patient's size. Um, and the injury to the posterior glottis scars slowly over time. So many of these patients are able to be decannulated um, in the immediate setting from their recovery. But what they develop over the next, um, over the next for those of that have gone on for a trach, and who can initially pass a capping trial, they develop um, significant glottic narrowing to where they become dysmic. And so a, a lot of this is that recognition in the two to three months out from hospital or rehab discharge and having follow-up um, should be something that, that, that really ought to be included in any outpatient um, protocol or inpatient protocol for that matter. I think talk, talking on the point of protocols, which is something that uh, Professor Marati and, and now uh, Professor Hill have, have, have touched upon, be it in the inpatient or outpatient setting, it really just means that you're thinking about it. Uh, and, and I think that's a really great point because a protocol is not um, necessarily something that can be implemented ad verbatim, it very much depends on the institution and the needs of that institution and, and that specific patient population. And I think that um, my other colleagues on the panel have made this point, but I think it's worth highlighting that protocols are a good thing, um, but it may not be appropriate in some instances even um, to apply to be, to be rigid with protocols because, for instance, I think as James said, um, you know, you may have an institution where there is a uh, heavy head and neck workload uh, or a heavy um, air and upper airway reconstructive workload where there is sufficient expertise uh, involved um, for protocols to maybe be not as appropriate. That's not to say that a team approach is not important. It just means that a protocol is a good start, um, but in my, in my opinion, is something that should be used as guidance mm -hmm. and tailored accordingly. I agree with you, Dr. Aurora. In my practice as well, there have been times when we have the protocol to guide us, but then there are times when we have to deviate from the protocol. And every single time I deviate from the protocol for a specific patient, I keep telling myself, what is my backup plan in case something goes wrong? So I think as long as we have a backup plan and we have the right um, experts involved in the management plan of care, I think uh, we will be safe and we'll be able to succeed in uh, decannulating our patients. I'm just wondering, would you want me to say some of the questions from the crowd? Yes, that would be great, Haley. Okay. 
Um, so Claire asks, at my organization, we rarely cap our patients and have had a high success rate in decannulation. Do you expect the patient to have demonstrated adequate upper airway patency through a brief one-minute finger occlusion of the FNE? I believe capping does not simulate normal breathing, particularly if they have larger cuff tubes. The Johns Hopkins protocol necessitates patients to have a tube changed to a smaller uncuffed tube. I would like the views of the others if they think capping is really essential. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, Dr. Marotti, we can't hear you. <laughs> we can hear you now. We can hear it's you too, now. Thank you, because I said some really fascinating, insightful stuff. Um, let me, let me, so I, it's a phenomenal question. It's an honest question. Personally, I would never decay on somebody without a capping trial, ever. Uh, now, when I say ever, would never, I mean, that sounds a little more like religion rather than science. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I think there, there's probably a scenario for it, but I think routinely doing it, I think I, I would worry about the run the risk of, of uh, missing uh, some problems. Your patient population, are you looking at the airway before you do it? I don't think you should decay that patient without looking. I think it happens all the time. And I, I don't know about the UK, if it happens there, it happens all the time in the States, and I think it's not great medicine. You should look at the airway before you decannulate it. The physiologic basis for all this, if you look back at Sasaki's work uh, back in the 70s, admittedly in an animal model, is that when you study patients and you bypass the larynx, the larynx doesn't function as well. The, the PCA muscles don't abduct as well. The sensation is altered. The latency, the threshold for stimulation is altered. All sorts of things happen to the larynx when they're tracheotomized that um, aren't just mechanical impairment of, uh, from having a tooth in place. There are, there are sensory and motor changes that occur. And I think the decannulation helps restore native airway function and helps you, I think, reduce the danger of decannulation having a, a patient unprepared. These are the patients we see later, believe me. They may look good after you decannulate them, but these are the patients we see later. Again, not speaking to this one person, but in general, that is a concern for me. I would not advise it personally. Um, I wonder if there are any of them, if there are any of um, can they get in, um, can they get in um, make a comment about their practice? I know that, that they don't use CAP capping trials there either, but instead go to a mini trach to kind of simulate the downsizing of the trach tube, allowing them to tolerate that before uh, decannulating. I, I, have, I have no experience of, uh, of that practice personally. Um, so I can't comment on, on that, I'm afraid, Vincia. Um, apologies. But I would like to bring in the concept of speech valves as opposed to um, capping and whether anybody, well, sorry, I, don't, I, I, would I would like to allow the other panels to comment on the mini trach and then also throw in the speech valve because I know I'm aware of some institutions where they won't block, they won't cap. They will pop a, the valve on, and if they tolerate the valve, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea of a mini trach. I, I I'm not I don't use it, but it, you know it still achieves some of our goals: serves your safety for emergencies, and you know slowly restores translaryngeal airway flow that ostensibly helps with some of the restoration or, or assuring restoration of laryngeal function prior to decannulation. I like it in theory. I don't practice it, but uh, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, at our institution at Hopkins, I don't recall in the last 10 years ever using a mini trach uh, prior to uh, decannulating someone. Um, but it was an interesting piece of information that I learned from our colleagues in Australia where they use mini trachs pretty much for every patient who needs to be decannulated. Uh, Haley, do you have any comments Sorry. from them? Yes, actually, um, someone from Australia, Susan, 
says the Australian practices now appear to be trying decannulation after just 24 hours of cuff deflation only. Can you comment? So um, they said that they, instead of capping, they just deflate them. Is that what you said? They deflate the cuff. So they try to decannulate after just 24 hours of cuff deflation only. Mm -hmm. I, th I would, my comment to that was I think probably in most situations that's probably okay, but the, the reason why a uh, capping trial is beneficial is it helps you pick up those two to five percent, hopefully less, of patients who have an airway stenosis and can't tolerate, uh, and then won't tolerate. Um, won't tolerate decannulation. I think Dr. Pandian's data speaks to that, where it was um, the only patient, there was one patient where the primary uh, team insisted on decannulating the patient even when they didn't pass the, the capping trial, and that was the one patient who failed um, decannulation. Thank you, Dr. Hillel, for mentioning that. Yes, that was um, a very enlightening data that we had when we had done um, study um, at our institution looking at all our patients all who underwent capping trial. And, and most of the patients who passed the patients who passed the trial um, successfully decannulated. And if they didn't pass, but if they put safety measures into place, they also successfully decannulated. But those patients who those failed patients the screen trial, and the physician or the provider who insisted on decannulating that patient ended up having an array that patient and actually the patient went got discharged and got readmitted with 24 hours. I think there are those unique when we can identify patients who cannot tolerate capping, or who cannot tolerate the decannulation by doing it in a standardized approach. Whether it's whether it's practice of using a mini tray or it's a practice of or a capping trial, but I think there needs to be some safety mechanism in place or safety measure to ensure that patient can truly tolerate prior to decision about. I think uh, I'd like to chime in again. Uh, I think looking is important, right? Consider the incidence of postreglotic stenosis in patients who've been intubated, right? Somebody who's in the ICU for their, or ITU, uh, uh, you know, for the, for some medical illness, they were tubed for two or three weeks. Their incidence of postreglotic stenosis of some degree of significance can be as high as 10, 15 percent, right? I mean, is that the patient you're going to just deflate their cuff not and not look at their throat and decannulate them? I think it's a gamble. Uh, I don't want to, you know, get these questions from an involved and interested group of participants and say, oh, I would never do that. Uh, but I've done that now, that I've said that twice. There are probably patients for whom they're fine. Maybe there's a referral or selection bias for the patients that I happen to be seeing. But be prepared. I mean, if you're not looking, you know, you don't really know what's going on down there. So I'd be very wary of that. Uh, and there may be a role for these patients getting, uh, avoiding decannulation trial. I, I think there probably is an answer out there, and but I'd be very selective about your patients. Know what they were intubated for or traped for, how long was it in there, what is their likelihood of developing problem? Because they may be getting out of your decan, they may be getting it by you, but that doesn't mean they're done with their throat problems. Mm -hmm. And I would just be, be very aware of that because God knows that is what we see. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the patients, and, uh, most of the patients uh, decannulation are the ones that Dr. Halal see later on in his clinic deals with stenosis and long-term issues. And then sometimes they have to go through fetal revisions and fetal revision surgeries because we can see attention to something that's full of their airway in a timely manner. Or somebody so hot to get the trach out that they're about to get their cardiac cath or whatever the next week and nobody, you know, everyone's so hot to get the trach out, especially because of the pressure to get them placed in long-term care because it's so challenging. The complexity that's added by the presence of tracheotomy to get patients out of the acute care setting is a phenomenal uh, phenomenal financial pressure. Uh, but there is some short-term good that may lead to some long-term bad that we just have to be careful. Mm -hmm. I agree and I think I'm aware that there are lots of, I'm aware that there are lots of
questions uh, by other people. I think the one thing to say here is that it's all about the patient population and what I'd be interested to hear about more, in fairness to our colleagues in Australia, is what exactly their patient population is with respect to the decanalation uh, protocol that they are applying at the moment where essentially they're um, deflating and then going on to decanalate. It, it, you know, it may be a more straightforward patient population in terms of the uh, anatomy and pathology that, that's that's going on there. But but I but I I, I in essence agree with with, with my two colleagues and um, have no experience again of that practice per se. Um, but are we do we um, have time for more questions? Um, it's actually five o'clock, and I think we have another meeting starting uh, like right now, so we may have to wrap this up in the interest of our colleagues. Well, what I would like to say as the, uh, as the, as the, as the chair of the webinar um, series is that, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Vincia, for your huge effort, yeah. and, uh, and, and to all of my uh, learned friends and uh, good colleagues um, on the panel for their efforts and their wisdom and their insight. Um, I think it's fair to say that there were quite a few questions uh, out there in the ether that we have been unable to address or answer. Um, but if if colleagues out there would like to put things in writing, um, we we can we can um, we can at least respond to some of the questions. I'd also um, like to take this opportunity to um, to ask you all to complete the post evaluation webinar um, in a timely fashion whilst it's still fresh. Uh, because um, really, it's only by uh, really getting to grips and analysing pre and post webinar evaluations um, that we can really improve this series, and that's what we really want to try and do. Um, and I think finally, um, I'd like to take this opportunity, in addition to thanking my panelists and thanking all the attendees out there that have registered in, um, to also flag up the next. Uh, webinar session and Haley, can you remind the folks out there as to when that is? So the next webinar will be uh, the first week of May on patient and family voices. Vincia, would you like to uh, say a few words? Um, you know, I would like to thank you and GTC for giving me and my panelists the opportunity. And I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Hillel, Dr. Marathi, and uh, Dr. Lynch as well for um, supporting our endeavor through this webinar. Um, so thank you, and thank you to all of you who have attended this um, webinar session. We really appreciate your um, time. and. I'm hoping that you can send some additional questions via email so we can continue this conversation. I don't want this webinar to occur and say this is the end of it. I want there to be some additional steps that we can take on to address these issues and see what is the best way to uh, remove the tracheostomy tube for our patients. Thank you. Okay.